next speaker has written a great book called Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. How we live, work, and think. Uh, today, he's the data editor at The Economist. He doesn't need any more introduction. I'm really looking forward to this talk again. Please welcome on stage, Mr. Ken Kukier. Yes. Okay. Hello and good afternoon. Big data is a big topic, so before I get into it, what I'd like to do is get a sense of who you are and collect a little bit of small data. Well, there's many of you, so maybe it is big data. I'd like to find out how many people here, if they had to define big data and define what it is, would, be, would feel comfortable doing so. So if you would be comfortable defining and giving a definition to big data, raise your hand. Okay, come on, don't be shy. Okay, well, yes, I know, I'm in Norway. Don't be shy, raise your hand if you would feel comfortable giving. Very good. Not that many, I see it's probably about well, 4.3 of you. So the uh, big data is a, is a big topic, and what I'd like to do is crystallize what it is, demystify it for you today, and to do that in the form of a story. And it's a story of a company, and it's a company called Faircast. So we all are familiar with flying in an airplane, the story is that a computer scientist in the United States needed to fly from where he was based in Washington State down to LA to his brother's wedding, and so he did what we all know to do. He bought his ticket long in advance before the day of departure. Because if you buy your ticket in advance, lo and behold, you save money. So he thought. So he gets onto the airplane the day that he has to go, and in the middle seat, he asks the person sitting next to him how much he paid. Turns out the person paid considerably less, even though he bought the ticket only a few days before. The professor is upset. He asks another person, and another, and another, and he finds out that most of the people around him have actually paid less for his, their ticket, even though they bought it long earlier than he did, where, excuse me, more closer to the day of departure than he did, and he bought the ticket sort of later in that, uh, in that series. And so he thinks this is very strange. You know, we, he thought he understood how airfares work, and it seems like he didn't. Now, the difference between a computer scientist and the rest of us is that when we land and we put our tray table up in the seat in the upright position, we leave the aircraft and we leave our troubles behind and we get on with life. Not computer scientists. What he has done is he sketches out on the back of a napkin a small little methodology that will do a souped-up version of what he's done in the plane on the internet. He will scrape travel sites, he will look for the prices of air, airline tickets, and he will identify the date of departure as well as the airline and lots of other features, and he will make a prediction whether the price is likely to go up or it's likely to go down. And so this would empower customers to know that they are likely, or in fact they should, buy the ticket right away because the price is likely to go up, or they should wait before buying because the price is likely to go down in time. He calls the research project Hamlet. To buy or not to buy, <laughs> that is the question. Okay. And so he gets some venture capital funding. This is the United States, after all. And now Faircast is airborne, and it's flying high, and it's saving passengers lots of money. Microsoft uh, hears about this technology, knocks on its door, and buys the company for $100 million. A lot of money. What were they buying? It was just data, wasn't it? So it turns out that it actually applies to lots of different problems, not just airlines. It could be hotel rooms. It could be used cars anything in which you have wide price variability, right? a commodity product, and lots of data to learn from. But here's the thing. By the year 2009, the startup Faircast was crunching 75 billion flight price records with which to score its predictions, which represents almost every single seat on every single route of every single airline for all of American civil aviation for an entire year. This is something that was unimaginable just a few years before, just a decade earlier, and now it was being done by a startup. But here's the nub. 
You just know that when they created electronic passenger records in the 1960s, never for a second did the airlines think that their own data could be used against them to undercut their business. Big data. So what's going on here? What's happening? There are several features to the story. Part of it is technology. We can do things that we simply couldn't do in the past. The second is that we have data, data to learn from that we didn't have earlier, and now we do have this data. And the tools with which we learn are better than ever. And the third, and at least for the moment, maybe the most important, is the mindset. The computer science professor, Ornezioni, had a big data mindset. He understood that the data could tell him something. He could unleash a form of economic value from it if he had the skills and the humility to listen. It's in this respect that when people talk about data, they are referring to it today as a new resource, a new raw material, a vital economic input. In economics, we traditionally thought of land, labor, and capital as the three factors of production. And we can appreciate why the classical economists in the 1700s didn't add information to the mix. Because back then, the idea that you could take information and reuse it in a form of supply chain as a raw material was a fiction in the same way that it was impossible to collect 75 billion flight price records using that to score a prediction of whether price tickets are going to go up or down just 10 or 15 years earlier still. But although the constraints on data still exist, they're nothing like they did, they're nothing like they were in the 1800s. And as a result, we can collect data, store it, and process it at almost no cost certainly compared to what it would have been like in the 1800s. And so the big data exists, and the world is different for it. So what does big data actually mean? How would we define it if we had to? Sadly, I can tell you that there is no hardcore definition of what it is. Maybe that's a good thing, because to define something is to constrain it. But we know it by some of its features, and also we know the origin of the term. Now, the words have appeared before together in certain inst instances. But what had happened was around the year 2000 or so, 2003, 2004, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the East Coast of America, like John Hopkins Astrophysics Lab, the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT and Cambridge, Moore's Law, by which we talked about earlier today, where we're doubling uh, in terms of the exponentials of the processing power that we have, it had just kind of made another double. It just went up another notch. And it, a whole slew of organizations and companies were swamped with information. Now, we've always had more information than ever before, but the key thing is this. It had gotten so large that it outstripped the tools necessary or able to compute it. So researchers had to innovate at the layer of the infrastructure, both hardware and software, just to run their analyses. Because what they were doing was so different in lots of different engineering ways from the way they handled data in the past, they needed a term to describe that they were doing something new. And so the term big data started getting used. At the same time, this is around 2002, 2003, a technique in artificial intelligence called machine learning, again, we talked a little bit about this already today, that didn't really work very well, started to work incredibly well not because we improved the algorithms and not simply because processing power was less expensive or memory was, was, was more abundant, but simply because we added more data to the problem, because if we had more data, we could learn from it. By adding more data, we could do things we couldn't in the past. And so the term big data there, too, start, was embraced by people. So although there is no real definition, and in fact, if you read the press, really what we're referring to when we say the big data is we're saying that we're applying ordinary statistics, even statistics that have been around for 100 years, to facets of everyday life that never had a quantitative bent before. And that's fine. We don't have to be religious about it. We can still use this weakened, diluted term, big data. The essence of it is this. There are things we can do with a large body of data that we simply cannot do if we're working with only smaller amounts of it. That a change in scale leads to a change in state. That a quantitative shift leads to a qualitative shift. Or if you prefer, more isn't just more. More is different. So what does more look like? Well, more looks like this. 
You can see that in the year 2000. We used to think that we were participating in the information society. We were doing so in name only. Even back then, the amount of stored analog information, things like books in a library, uh, you know, paintings in a museum, post-it notes, vinyl LP records, it vastly outstrips the amount of digital information. But of course, analog information grows linearly. Digital information grows exponentially. So by the year 2002, it would be about parity, and then whoosh, it's all over. Right now, this is data is from Science, which is probably the most authoritative, the journal Science, uh, the most authoritative research that had been done quantifying the amount of information in the world. It's from 2007. I didn't extrapolate. But we know that the amount of digital information doubles roughly every two or three years, and so stored digital information. So you can see that by 2010, the large purple part at the bottom would be twice as long, so it'd be probably to the floor, and the small pink part on top would be half as large. By 2013, we would have doubled that again, so we're now through the ceiling, down you know, several meters into the earth, and the pink part is now half again, and by 2016, we've done that again, and so now we're approaching very quickly, and if we did that maybe about um, 10 times, we'd be getting into the stratosphere, and if we did it 11 times, just one more doubling, we'd get to the moon and back. Okay, so you can see that exponential growth is very fast growth, and we don't see much to actually change this. This seems like it's going to be a constant. Even if Moore's Law is slowing down, we can still be creating more data and collecting more data, because we can just put more chip factories online. Okay. To give an example of what this means, think about one area of life, the Human Genome Project. Around 2000, the year 2000, about 25 nations in the world all got together and they sequenced the human genome for the first time, all three billion base pairs. It took them about a decade to do, cost them about a billion dollars to do it. Today, a single genomics facility can sequence a human genome in about a day for about a thousand dollars. So what does this tell us? Well, if you think about it, it's gonna tell us a few things. The first is that the era of personalized medicine is dangling there before us. We will not be creating a drug around the fiction of an, the average man, to which no any person truly belongs, but we will have drugs tailored around your genotype, and your genotype, and who you are. And it'll probably work a lot better as well. But secondly, although this is an extreme example in genomics, every industry is being swamped with more data, whether you're in tourism, whether you're in transport, you're in logistics, you're in media, you're in shipping, there's more data than ever before. And all you need to do is just have a febrile mind, just think more broadly, and think about what the future might look like in another 10 years. What will that bring, right? Will we have, will we be sequencing the human genome in a second? Will it cost a dollar, or am I off by two orders of magnitude, and it'll only cost a penny? And there was a flourishing of creativity in Britain in the 1800s when they created the penny post, and people could communicate by letter within the, within the same day, multiple times during the day. And for letters, for, the, for men of letters and women of letters who were, who were writing great works of literature, this was an incredible way of information sharing. What will it mean when we have the penny genome? When every single soda can has a GPS module in it, as well as analyzes your biochemistry? because perhaps that's the world that we're walking into. We don't really know, but we know it'll look different than it does today. So how does all this technology work? What are we talking about? I, I can imagine that many of you are probably somewhat befuddled. I know I would be if I had seen self-driving cars and self-driving sh ships and all the different things that we've heard about from Brad and Gert and others today. What does it mean? Well, one of the most foundational technologies that we have to think about is the area of machine learning, okay? Machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a part of computer science. But that's sort of the, the formal definition. Here's what's really going on. Artificial intelligence was created around the 1950s by people, again, computer science department, but it really shared its sort of academic lineage with philosophy. What they were trying to do was to enshrine in the structure of, of formulaic logic that would then be transcribed into computer code how a mind works. It didn't work. So, move on, fast forward to machine learning. It does not share its lineage with artificial intelligence and therefore computer science and 
and with, uh, and with philosophy, but with mathematics and statistics. What it does is it cares about collecting a lot of data and then analyzing it to find patterns. Because if you find patterns in the data, what you can do is have the algorithm determine what to do under a given set of circumstances and infer what to do rather than be explicitly told what to do. Okay. To give an even richer example of what I mean by that, let me give you an example, and it's an example of where the idea came from. This is Arthur Samuel, and he is a computer scientist, and he was a computer scientist in IBM in the 1950s. And he liked to play the board game checkers. So what do you do if you're a computer scientist at IBM in the 1950s and you like to play checkers? You write a computer program to play checkers. So he writes the program, he plays the machine, and he wins. He plays the machine, he wins. He plays the machine, he wins again because the machine only knows what a legal move is. Arthur Samuel knows something else. Arthur Samuel knows strategy. So, he writes a small sub-program that operates in the background, and all it does is it calculates and recalculates the likelihood that a given board configuration is likely to lead to a winning board versus a losing board. He plays the machine again. He wins. He plays the machine, he wins. And then Arthur Samuel leaves the machine to play itself. It plays itself, it collects more data. It collects more data, it increases the accuracy of its predictions. And then Arthur Samuel plays it and he loses. And he plays it and he loses. And Arthur Samuel has built a machine that exceeds his own abilities in a task that he taught it. And this idea of machine learning is going everywhere. It is the foundation of what eventually became the deep learning algorithm that Google DeepMinds used to crush, by four games to one, the world's best Go player. And Go is infinitely more complex than something like checkers or chess. It is the backbone of lots of things. In fact, we use machine learning every single day and we hardly even know it. So if I were to type into Google the name of today's fantastically rich and amazingly interesting moderator, and I get Pellegrino's last name wrong and I put a D at the end of it, who at Google knew? Like, who did Google employ to know that in fact it's Pellegrino Ricard D, no extra D, and to give me the different results? Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Now, Google doesn't em employ that. Google doesn't know it. They didn't have to upload a dictionary of all the different you know, cross-cultural translators in the world. No, not at all. So what they did is it, they used a machine learning algorithm. Right? They simply scanned the entire global internet in, let's see, it's point, 0.56 of a second, and they noticed that instantiations of the word pair Pellegrino Riccardi were far more frequent without the D than with the D. And in fact, there probably is the typo you know, if I type search instead, it probably exists somewhere, but they could find out that I probably wasn't looking for that in, the, in a bout of transparency. They not only made this prediction, but they actually indicated to me that um, they were doing so that I could actually find maybe the person I was looking for that has a D at the last name. It is because of machine learning that computer translation is not as laughable as it has been in the past, that we have speech recognition software that actually works. We've spoken a lot today about self-driving cars. The whole point of the self-driving car is that if we were to try to enshrine all the rules of the road into software, we would fail. The world is too complex. There's too many exceptions. We'd never get it done. Original AI tried to do that, but it was too brittle. It didn't work. Instead, big data, machine learning, means that we changed the nature of the problem by transforming it into a data problem, collecting as much data as we could. Brad did a fantastic job of showing all the sensors that were on there. And then we applied machine learning to it to actually identify what to do at a given moment. When the car has a computer in it and it makes a thousand pr predictions a second, lo and behold, we finally were able to get a car that could drive itself. Research recently, just a few years ago from Stanford, looked at whether a computer vision and machine learning algorithm could actually diagnose whether a given cell biopsy of breast cancer was highly cancerous or not. 
And sure enough, it worked. It worked very well. In fact, it worked better than the human pathologist, more accurate. The algorithm was able to identify the 12 telltale signs that a given biopsy was cancerous. The problem? The medical literature only knew of nine of them. Three of the traits that the algorithm was able to identify, doctors didn't know to look for. It was naked to the human eye, but the algorithm could spot it in a large body of data. So if you are a pathologist and you have to wonder what brings you value in your life, you might have to rethink what you do. Because just simply making judgments under conditions of uncertainty is not good enough anymore. The algorithm is better than you are. But of course, if what you do as a white collar professional is anything related to making decisions under conditions of uncertainty and applying your skill and your wisdom and your sense of judgment, then you need to rethink what you do as well because the algorithm is probably going to gun for your job as well as Martin Ford has done a beautiful job of explaining. Now, I'm not as pessimistic as some people are about what this will mean because I don't think it simply means that we're going to have the same amount of pathology readings of cancer cells, and we'll just simply replace the doctors with the algorithm that what we're doing. I think that's a little bit short-sighted. If Moore's law hits cancer screening, well, the cost of cancer screening might eventually fall to the same cost it is to press your space bar on your computer. And if that's the case, then what this would mean is that we can actually not scan, say, in Norway, you know, 100,000 people across a year or across a month, but we might look at 3 million people across an hour. And in fact, we will be screening for lots of diseases all the time. We'll both expand coverage and we'll be, by doing it, say, on a daily basis, we'll learn something new about disease that we didn't know before so we could staunch it earlier. So rather than someone presenting themselves when a lump is forming, we know features about their life and their biochemistry long before when something starts growing until the systems are manifest. So I'm a bit more optimistic of what this will mean, but it does mean that things are going to change. And of course, my example has been about hospitals, and if they're about hospitals, they're about humans, but I want to suggest that my example is really not about hospitals, and it's really not about humans, and it's not about business or customers either. It's something broader still. It's really about a way of looking at the world in a very different way. It's about thinking of every single leaf, every single car, every single cloud, every single breath, every single heartbeat, every single rock that's over there, and every single wave that's over here, and thinking about it under the lens of data. The world as a platform for the collection and the analysis of data. Now, one reason why we have so much data in the world today is that we're taking things that have always been information and collecting more information about it. But another reason why is that we're taking things that have always been informational and not rendered as data, and we're turning it into data, right? We're, we're datifying it, for so to speak. Datification. So let's think of the example of location, okay? Where somebody is at any one time is a matter of information, but it may not be a matter of data. So if I were to ask you 200 years ago, where is Crown Prince Christian Frederick? You know, is he in Eidsvoll or is he in Oslo? Where Crown Prince Christian Frederick is, is a matter of information. And if I wanted to follow him, I would have a quill and parchment, and I'd say, Crown Prince Frederick is in Eidsvoll. Right? Hard problem, I'd have to look at my stopwatch, or I guess I wouldn't have a watch, maybe I'd have an hourglass or a sundial, right? find out where he is. Okay. But today, we know that somewhere in the world, there is a database that has your location and where you've been probably going back an entire decade for every second of your life. Now, of course, the database is in Langley, Virginia, but nevertheless, the fact is, it exists. No, it might, be in your, it might actually be in your, cell, your telephone carrier's data warehouse. Okay. Data location has become a matter of data. Now think of the issue of posture, the way that you're sitting, the way that you're sitting over there, the way that you're sleeping over there, the way that you're sitting over there. 
it's all different, right? It's a function of your back and your contours of your back, your weight and the distribution of your weight. And if I was to throw 100 sensors into every single chair right now, I could create an index that's fairly unique to you. A little bit like your fingerprint, but it's not your finger. Okay. So what could I do with this? Researchers in Tokyo are using this technology as a potential anti-device in cars. The idea is a thief drives, a carjacker drives, sits behind the wheel, tries to steam, stream off your vehicle, and the car knows that an unapproved driver is behind the wheel. Maybe the engine stops unless you type in a password. Okay. For the parent of a teenager, maybe you can think of a useful technology <laughs> with this. Okay. What if every single car in Norway, actually every single car in Europe, right, had this technology in it? What could we do with it then? Maybe we'd be able to identify that an accident is about to take place in the next five seconds. And what we'll have datafied is driver fatigue. And the car would know that when it senses, it detects that the driver has slumped into a given position, it would vibrate the steering wheel or honk internally to the vehicle to say, hey, wake up, pay more attention to the road. Maybe it'll simply take command of the vehicle and drive it safely off to the side. These are the sorts of things we can do when we datafy more aspects of living. We can store the data, share it, process it, use it to extract new forms of value from it. So what is the value of data? Well, in the past, the value of data was the primary purpose for which it was put. In the world of big data, the value of the data shifts to all the secondary uses with which we can now harness the data from. So think about it this way. Walmart collects receipts, right? And it's just looking at transactions for bookkeeping. Several years ago, they were able to take their big database of former transactions, and they were to compare it to weather data. And they were able to identify that whenever a storm was approaching America's Northeast, not only would sales of storm supplies, like flashlights and batteries increase, but also sales of Pop-Tarts, the sugary American breakfast treat. Okay. Not food, but it's a treat. Okay. So we don't know why this is the case, but we can see the correlation and we can act on it. You know, by understanding consumer behavior better, Walmart could stock the Pop-Tarts at the front of the store, easing life for consumers before the storm, as well as boosting sales. The point is that the value of the data was the reuse of the data. The data had become a strategic corporate asset. But you don't get this asset for free. It's hard to bolt it on at the end. You have to design it in from the very beginning. You have to build it in at the outset. The ability to collect data and learn from it and try to get as much data as you possibly can in the format that you need it from. Because if you try to do it at the end, it's going to be a lot harder. This has huge implications for business strategy. We all know how decisions are made in companies. They are made by very intelligent, wise people that look like this. Now, of course, this is an old photograph. It doesn't look like this anymore. We now have one token woman at the board. <laughs> not like that anymore. But this is still how we made decisions. We would collect some data. It's not like they were enumerate. No, actually, they would collect data. They would cogitate upon this data. They would think. They'd look at it, and they'd come up with what they think the answer is. They would go forward, implement it, and a year later, after they've gotten some experience, they would commission a study, pay a lot of money, find out it didn't work, and then at the next board meeting, three months later, they'd have to change direction. That is not how you would do it if you were to do it in the 21st century. You would actually have business strategy operate a little bit like the Roomba robot. Right? The Roomba robot doesn't actually know the configuration of your room, it just simply goes forward and it collects data. It actually bumps into things, and by bumping into things and making mistakes, it course corrects just ever so slightly, and eventually it learns the contours of your room, because there's a machine learning algorithm there. And it would actually be more efficient if you could actually design perfectly the blueprint and upload it into the Roomba of what your room of your house looked like, so it know to avoid the chair leg there, and the table leg there, and the wall there. Hard problem, you get it off by a centimeter, the room is going to be bumping into your chair leg until the battery drains, right? Not going to happen. 
Instead, we design it with a machine learning algorithm, which is allowed to make mistakes, but of course corrects because it learns from the data that it collects. And this is going to mean a lot for business strategy because it's going to be a new way of thinking about how we run our businesses. This is how Amazon does it, in which every pixel on its homepage has to earn its place there through an A-B test. And it's also why every single homepage at Amazon is different for every single individual, tailored to who you are. And lots of other Silicon Valley companies are doing this. This sort of approach is going to come to business more generally. With all the technology trends, what it requires of us is a new way of thinking. So what is actually going to happen when every single product has a microprocessor into it? And all of those microprocessors are actually connected to everything else. We can see a small sign of what it's going to be, in which, like case, the Nest thermostat by Google or Alphabet simply learns when people are in and out of their house and the, the energy usage of the house to actually be more efficient about how they use energy and heat the homes. We've seen that with the Amazon Echo and now with Google's product as well. And of course, it's changing lots of different features, not small things in Silicon Valley, but really big, heavy things. We heard from Rolls-Royce today about self-driving ships. But of course, Rolls-Royce, they don't sell engines anymore. That was very 20th century. They lease engines. And the reason why they lease engines is because they throw sensors into it and they can identify the state and the performance of those engines while they're in use in quasi real time so that when it lands, it can actually do a better job in maintenance and they can lower their cost on their service fees by actually managing the engine for the air carrier. Now, the air carrier loves this. They don't want to pay a couple, you know, tens of millions of dollars for an aircraft engine before they've even sold a single ticket. Right? It's great to be on a leasing model. And of course, Wall Street loves the fact that Rolls-Royce is on a subscription revenue business rather than a one-time sale business. Imagine how hard it is to be the Rolls-Royce salesman right? in like 1980, 1990, where you work all this time, huge sales cycle, probably three years, lots of dinners to curry favor with the, with the, with the buyer of the aircraft engine, and then they buy the engine and you wave goodbye to them as they take ownership of it, knowing that in 15 years they're gonna come back for another one. Like, bad idea. Recurring revenue is really nice. Everybody loves this, and, and, the, and the investors like this as well because it gives more predictability to the model and you can actually finance the R&D for new aircraft engines. So everybody wins, but it took data. It took sensors to understand something about the state of the engine that you wouldn't have known before you had the ability to measure it as you can when you can collect the data. And this idea is transforming how we think about how we run our companies. You know, will goods become services, a little bit like the Rolls-Royce engine model? Will the power shift to the consumer? It's not clear what's going to happen, but what's certain is that while we talk about disruption and what that's going to mean as a problem for companies, we also have to understand that disruption can be turned into an advantage for companies, provided you're comfortable with one thing, and that is change change in the organizations and the people who work for them. What you need to know changes. Who you need to know changes. Who you need to work with changes. Who you, you are going to compete against will change. And lots of assumptions, things that we believe are so sacrosanct that we don't even see it anymore, will become obsolete overnight. Think about it. In the world of self-driving cars, Will we still need windshield wipers? Maybe we'll need more of them. Because what else are we going to do when we're in the car but look out the window? The fact is, we don't know. But we do know that there is a peril for those people who are not willing to use their imagination and their creativity to try to tap into some of these trends and harness those changes to their advantage. And the good news is that there is a great advantage to legacy operators, to the incumbent, to existing businesses. And this is different than at the outside of the World Wide Web. At the outset of the web, advantage absolutely shifted to the startup, those companies that were unencumbered by legacy business models, so they could rethink banking, they could re rethink book selling. But in a world of big data, the advantage shifts now to the legacy company. And the reason why is the substance, the raw material to make you a smarter, more efficient company 
is your data and who has the data but the legacy operator. In the world of big data, access to data is critical. Now, of course, there can be too much access to data. The world of big data has risks as well. And the first one, of course, is going to be privacy. Privacy was a problem in a, big, in a small data universe. It's a problem in a big data world as well. It's going to be a bigger problem. And just as in the world of small data, we've never solved the problem of privacy, we're not going to solve privacy in big data. There's nothing to solve. We're just always going to have to manage the problem of privacy. In the same way that we've not solved the problem of governance since the Greeks and democracy, we're always managing the, uh, the problem of democracy and how to govern ourselves uh, today in 2016. In fact, as an American looking upon my own political system, you can say we truly have not managed the problem of democracy and governance. Uh, and we can hope for the best. But there's another problem, and it's, it's different now, and it's the idea of propensity. Okay? It's the idea that we're going to have algorithms that will predict what we are likely to do, and we will be held accountable before we've actually acted. This is exactly what Pellegrino was talking about. It's the world of Minority Report, right? in which what do you do if you are the, if you are the, uh, the police chief in Ausland, in Elsund? And I now see that I've got a 95% you know, likelihood that that man over there is going to commit a crime. What do I do? Do I arrest him? And if I do, I'm taking away his personal freedom. Or do I recognize that he has moral choice and, 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 and free will, and I don't actually do anything? And people will then say I'm anti-science because 95% is a very good, you know, good percentage. And the fellow can certainly say, hey, by your own statistic, I've got a 5% likelihood of doing the right thing at the right time. You can't deny me my liberty. I think society's going to need to have a debate about that, because one of the things that makes us human is our capacity for moral choice, you know, for, for, our, for having human volition and agency and free will. And maybe to deny people that is to deny, some, deny something that's human in them. At the same time, another risk is the question of ownership. Who owns all this data anyway? Is it the person who gave it up or the entity who bothered to collect it? And finally, the issue of algorithmic transparency. Recently, it was revealed that Uber could tell whether people's battery was low, and they found that there was a correlation, that people were far more likely to accept surge pricing when their battery was very low than at other times. And it makes sense, because if, you're, if your battery is about to conk out, Right? You really want to make sure that you're going to get into the car and go to your next de destination, because you might really be out of luck. Right? Now, they say that they don't act on it, but it reveals the idea that we are disclosing lots of information, and we're not totally sure how it's being used, maybe used against us in ways that we don't feel comfortable with as a society. So we're going to have to have conversations about these themes. And as we do, let me leave you with this. What we absolutely need to do at the same time is remember the limitations of the data, that we cannot worship the data like some form of alchemy in which we accept the black box, but we don't understand how it works, because the data is always limited. It is always a simulacrum of reality, not the real thing, in the same way that a map is not territory. And while we absolutely must embrace big data and use it, it cannot come at the expense of our values, our sense of justice, our sense of fairness, our common sense. If not, we wouldn't be a wise society, and I think we're better than that. So what will the future bring? Well, in the past, it took a deliberate action to quantify and to measure. In the future, I believe everything will be quantified and everything will be measured, and it'll take a deliberate act not to quantify and not to measure. I think the benefits outweigh the drawbacks. I look forward to seeing what happens. Thanks a lot. Yeah, good, thanks. Again, fascinating stuff. I want to keep you on stage a little bit, actually. Sure. Um, do there are any questions? Any questions from the audience? I think Brad there took the role last time and sort of ran the show. Any questions? Just looking at the in the audience. I believe I've waved red meat before you. I've sufficiently antagonized you by saying you're going to be out of luck 
out of a job, will have to change what you do, your children have no hope, they're gonna be working for an algorithm rather than working for the man, surely there has to be one question. <laughs> I'm a journalist, you can, this is your chance to tell me about the problem with your subscription. <laughs> Questions? I have a question for you. Okay, here we go. Right, yes, to the front here. Fantastic. Just wait for a microphone. So. Hi. So uh, I work in advertising, and we, especially in digital, digital marketing, we use a lot of big data to target our consumers and companies as well. And I was just wondering, because now you can micro-target consumers down to the point where you know their name, their age, their house, their dog, and everything. And how does consumers protect themselves from this? Is, this, is it us or the companies who owns the data? How can I or everyone else protect themselves? It's going to be really hard, and it's going to get harder. Regulation can help us a little bit. In Europe and America, the the rules are sort of going in different directions. Uh, in Europe, we're getting a sort of quasi-ownership right to the data so that we can inspect it, we can change it, and we have those rights. In America, that doesn't exist. I'm not certain which is best, to be honest, because I don't want to restrict the use of big data. The same technologies that you might find uncomfortable because it feels like a violation of yourself, <coughs> excuse me, might actually save your life in a medical context. We could find out that um, in the case of Ebola, I'm making this up, but we might find out that people um, who are in pro close proximity of dogs, of canines, are more likely to contract Ebola than others, and so we might want to make sure that you get a certain health warning or a certain sort of um, prophylactic to take to prevent the disease uh, that we wouldn't otherwise know and give you. But if privacy law restricts the ability to, to save your life, you would say, well, well, that's crazy. I'm happy with in this context. I'm not happy in that context. But the rules have to cover the waterfront. So it's, it's going to be a hard, it's a hard problem to solve. Um, but I think that ultimately, we're going to have to become a bit more comfortable with sharing personal information and it being out there because it's going to be harder and harder to protect it. Well, we have a data barons or data specialists, whatever you want to call them, taking some kind of oath that they won't abuse data that they... I mean, are we there yet? Yeah, it's such a good question. We're not there yet, but I think you're actually right. I think the answer is yes. Okay. Um, and in the, in the book Big Data, we actually bring that up, the idea of, of algorithmists. Um, civil engineers have to take oaths of conduct, and, and doctors, of course, had to take oath of, con of conduct, you know, first do no harm. It's a serious oath that you could actually be just you sort of taken, your medical license can be taken away if you actually don't follow. And the whole idea of that comes from medieval butchery in which, like, you'd experiment on your patient because that's how you would learn. So we're probably going to go down the same road, route in which the person who manages algorithms for a big company where it affects lots of people has the same responsibility as a, a civil engineer or like a, a, the, the privacy uh, officer of a large company has an, a certain code of conduct and an industry body that they must adhere to of, of, of standards of practice of continuing education and if they don't adhere to that standard of practice that they in effect get disbarred and the reason why is that just like with law or auditing um, accounting or medical service uh, these are professions and they are and they have huge societal impacts I've never heard that term before, algorithmist. Yes. Sounds like a novel. Could but be a book, couldn't it? Could be a book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, more questions from the audience. Great question, by the way. Yes, here we are. I, I think your last comment was uh, super interesting about how doctors take oaths and civil engineers take oaths. Um, but I think in, in those industries, it's in the interest of those people to be good, um, ethically good. It's good for doctors to save people. They, they are good, uh, they can continue business. It's not good for civil engineers to make bridges that fall down. But with big data, there's so much potential for doing bad. There's conflicts of interest. Yep. It's not inherently, you have to be good to continue doing well. In fact, being bad, you might be better at your job. Yeah, um, totally, tr totally true. And so that's, I just, 
if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's absolutely essential. Uh, one example to look at is the chief privacy officer function within companies, particularly in places like Germany, because there you actually have divided interests, you have divided loyalties, and the reporting line has to be different. You, um, there's lots of so there's lots of different businesses or roles in society in which we have to manage a conflict of interest. Let me give you two. The first one is a board of directors. If you're a director of a board, right? Your interest is not management. You don't support management. You, your fiduciary responsibility are to other shareholders. Now, sometimes there can be majority shareholders and minority shareholders so they can disagree. But that's why the only way, if, if other directors want to vote you off the board, do you leave? No. Only shareholders can, can remove a director from a board because his, his, his loyalty is to, no one, to someone who's not in the room, not the managers who are there and not the other directors. Likewise, lawyers. Right? This is super complex, right? Who does a lawyer have an obligation to? To justice? No. To his client, right? Leads to, that's why you have protect, protected confidentiality, right? That's why the lawyer, the first thing a lawyer is gonna say if committed to a crime is to say, you don't have to tell me if you did it, but I do have to know if you didn't do it. And think about that. Like how, right? Because he can't be in a position in which he knows something that he might have to disclose, but he still needs to know some information. So if you simply don't say, I didn't pull the trigger and you leave it silent, he will defend you to the end, right? So it's a hard problem. We're not gonna solve it. We didn't solve it with these other issues. We're not gonna solve it with big data. So big data is gonna look a lot like the rest of society. We're gonna have to muddle through. I think that's a really good way to sum it up, you know? We're looking at an uncertain future, we're gonna to have to muddle through, but history has shown us that we deal with the problem eventually. It's about attitudes, great. Everyone, a big round of applause, that was really great. Thanks right. so much, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks great. for the Thank you.